Submariners have something of a well-earned reputation as ingenious problem solvers. This was earned in the early days of submarines, when life and death hinged on a thin steel hull and temperamental equipment working properly. Stories like that of S-5 or S-48 are common. Tales of heroic survival by men who take what they're given and make it work. While less attention-grabbing than tilting a submarine on her nose or tail and crawling out the other end, the story of USS R-14 is another of these events. A small coastal submarine, her crew stranded at sea with no fuel for her diesel engines and a busted radio. Did these men resign themselves to their fate? No, they did not. Their submariners in the age where such men were considered mildly crazy for sticking themselves in a thin metal tube. They took the situation, looked at their options, and ran with it. Before that, of course, I'll give a little background on R-14 herself. This will be a short video, though, so let's get into it. USS R-14 was laid down on November 6th, 1918, as one of the R-Class coastal submarines. These were small submarines intended for, well, coastal and harbor defense. In comparison to their direct successors and the more famous S-boats, these were about half the displacement and a good 30 to 50 feet shorter. These were not submarines intended to go on long-distance patrols away from their home port. They only carried four 21-inch torpedo tubes and eight torpedoes with a single 3-inch deck gun as well. Bearing that in mind, R-14 was launched on October 10, 1919, and commissioned on December 24th of the same year. Her initial service, with the Great War done and over with, was about as one could expect. She had her shakedown crews off the New England coast before, in July 1920, heading off for the Pacific. Reassigned to Pearl Harbor, she would spend nearly the entirety of the 1920s helping develop submarine and anti-submarine warfare tactics. As well as participating in search and rescue operations, which is where her story diverges from her sisters and gets really interesting. Because, in May of 1921, a Navy tug, the Constatoga, went missing on the way to Hawaii. Don't forget that this is 1921, for the record. The Pacific fleet was smaller than it would become, and Pearl Harbor was by no means the fleet base it would become. That the Navy had R-14 join the search is less surprising with that context. So it was, under the acting command of Lieutenant Alexander Douglas, R-14 was ordered to conduct a surface search for the missing tug. While this was ranging fairly far out for a coastal submarine, it was expected to still be a fairly routine search and rescue mission. As routine as these sort of things ever are. Things went off the rails when the submarine reached the area where they expected the tug to be. Not only was there no sign of the missing ship, but the crew found themselves in a situation where they would need to be rescued instead. After 10 days of searching for the missing tug, the submarine had run out of usable fuel. Not because of ranging too far out, but because the remaining fuel was contaminated with seawater. On a leaky 1920s submarine, that wasn't an unusual situation. The crew was only able to purify enough fuel to manage a few minutes of power, nowhere near enough to either return home or power the batteries enough to do it that way. What made it more problematic was that the submarine had left on such short notice that she only carried 14 days of food and water. Which, if you're keeping track, means that she was down to 4 days of food and water now. With her radio failing as well, R-14 was stuck adrift with limited supplies. She was a small speck off of the usual shipping lanes, so relying on someone stumbling by, like it happened with S-5, was not exactly ideal. It was at this point that the Submariner Ingenuity comes into play. On May 12, 1921, Douglas had an idea. Knowing that he lacked enough fuel to return to port, he had already ordered the submarine to turn off all non-essential electrical instruments. Right down to the oven, forcing the crew to eat cold food with their rationed water supply. This would keep enough power in the main battery to at least move the boat, but nowhere near enough to return to Hawaii. The solution was simple, ingenious, and utterly insane all the same. Douglas would simply sail R-14 back to Hawaii. And I do mean that literally. 
A foresail made of 12 hammocks was sewed together by the Submariners. This was attached to the torpedo loading crane, along with a top boom made from five pipes from the bunks lashed together to create the sail just ahead of the bridge. The result would be a sail about 25 feet wide and 6 feet high that could be swiveled to catch the wind, which the crew did, setting a course for Hawaii. The submarine took to the sail like an old longboat, even managing to use her rudder, albeit slowly, for course adjustments. Though, on the one sail, she was only making about one knot of speed. So, Douglas simply ordered a mainsail made of six blankets, in addition to the already MacGyvered sail. This sail would be attached to the radio mast, which admittedly wasn't really doing much at the moment with a busted radio, at the after end of the bridge structure. The addition of the new sail pushed R-14 to one and a half knots, which is still a crawl, but it's not as if a submarine was designed to operate under sail. It was fortunate, really, that the weather was calm and the wind gentle. It didn't help with the speed, but R-14 was a small submarine and didn't exactly handle rough seas well on a good day. With the need to keep men on deck to manage the sails, that was even more of a concern. Still, on the next day, May 13th, Douglas would order a third sail put together. This would create an impromptu mizzenmast out of eight blankets, more bunk frames, and the after part of the torpedo loading crane. This third sail, directly aft of the conning tower, increased speed to two knots. Now with three sails, and looking like some bizarre time-traveling submarine, R-14 sailed home at a stately two knots in fine weather and a gentle breeze. Her crew was dead tired, having worked non-stop to get the sails together and then operate them. With a good chunk of their bunking torn apart for the sails, they had little in the way of sleeping arrangements when they weren't on shift topside. Even so, their spirits had been lifted, and the submarine sailed home. By May 14th, she was only about 25 miles away from Hilo, though at her speed, it would be another day to get there. Which is where Mother Nature threw a curveball at midnight on the 15th by reversing the wind. This was accompanied by fog and rain, lowering visibility for several hours. Coupled with a current of about a knot pushing the submarine back, and R-14 was managing only a single knot once again. With morning came clear weather, though, and R-14 was close enough to see the lights of the island. Douglas, at about 5 a.m. that morning, ordered the batteries turned on and the sails stowed. R-14 sailed under her own power into Hilo at that point, having been under sail for 64 hours. So impressive was this display that the officer in charge of R-14's division, Commander Chester Nimitz, wrote a letter of commendation to Douglas. And yes, it is that Chester Nimitz. In any case, after that tale of dogged determination, R-14 returned to fairly standard R-boat duty. She would return to the Atlantic in December 1930 and spend her time training with the submarine school. When World War II kicked off for the United States, she remained off the East Coast, continuing her training missions. The most exciting thing to happen to her during the war would be when Army Coastal Artillery mistook her for a U-boat when she sailed by Fort Zachary Taylor on the surface. This was on June 29, 1943, and the fort opened fire on her off Key West. Luckily for all involved, the old submarine didn't take any damage here. Of course, by the end of the war, R-14 was outdated and worn out. It should come as little surprise that she would be decommissioned on May 7, 1945, and sold for scrap in September. She would ultimately be scrapped in Philadelphia in 1946. Her service wasn't anything to write home about, perhaps, but that incident with the sails is worth remembering. For the ingenuity of her crew, and the determination they showed in getting their boat home, no matter what it took. Thank you for watching. Remember to like, comment, and subscribe if you enjoy the content, and I'll see you in the next one.